recording. There we go. I like that. Forgot to record. You guys are supposed to remind me of those things, but it's okay. Uh, I haven't missed a whole lot of things. So let's read. Let's read in Matthew 22, 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, this is Jesus talking, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Then Mark 12, uh, 28 through 34, uh, again, I'm reading from the ESV. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, and that the person answering well was Jesus, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbors as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And then Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, again from the ESV. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, uh, my inter parenthetical there, uh, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell in among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own camel and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took, him out, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and Lord, we thank you that you have not left us wondering what you want us to do. And even though passages like this may take us some thought and process to, to come to the truth that you're teaching us, Lord, I just pray that you would help for this to be a good time of discussion, a good time of interaction, Lord, that we could learn from your word, that we could learn from your Holy Spirit, that we could learn from one another. And just thank you for all that you have done for us. And again, Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done on our behalf. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So just a little bit of background or just some commentary as we, as we go along here. Um, we need to realize that this question from the, uh, the lawyer was not an honest question. The, the lawyer... Um, was doing this to put Jesus to the test. Now, it's, it's interesting, you read the three different accounts, and that the first two accounts, um, Jesus is the one who provides the answer. And the third account here in Luke, Jesus turns it around on the lawyer and asks the lawyer, the guy who 
interprets the law for the nation of Israel, one of the people interprets the law of the nation of Israel, you know, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Um, so it would seem to me that these three interactions are actually perhaps three different lawyers. Uh, I wasn't able really to, to nail that down, um, but, I, but I think that would be a, a fair summation that because each one is slightly different, that these were three different ones. But in this case, as the other case was a test, but it wasn't an honest question. As a lawyer, he, uh, teach the law, he should already know uh, what it was. But um, it's interesting, Jesus says to him, it's like, well, you know, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer said, no, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus' response says, you have answered correctly. He says, do this and you will live. Now, it's um, really kind of interesting because it, the, 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 the teacher, the, the lawyer, had asked life's most important question about eternal life. Um, and it's interesting that Jesus does not um, refer him back to the teachers of the law, but rather he refers him back to the Bible, back to Scripture. I like this statement by um, uh, J.C. Rouse. says, we should notice in this passage the high honor which our Lord Jesus Christ places on the Bible. He refers to the lawyer at once to the scriptures as the only rule of faith and practice. He does not say in reply to his question, what does the Jewish church say about eternal life? Or what do the scribes and Pharisees and the priests think about eternal life? He says what, he doesn't say what is taught um, on the subject in the tradition of the elders. He makes it far simpler and more direct. He sends the questioner at once to the writings of the Old Testament and says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And so he takes him back there, and the man does give the right answer. But what is um, interesting about this is that it then says that the, the lawyer wanting to justify himself, and it's interesting that they're doing a word study on the word justify, it is to pronounce a verdict not surprising from a lawyer, uh, to pronounce a verdict that someone is in full accordance with the requirements of the law. This, this teacher wanted to prove that not only did he know what the law said about eternal life, but that he was in complete accordance and fulfilling this requirement. And this is where Jesus launches into the parable of, of the Good Samaritan. Um, we need to realize, and I'll read the this, this story again as we go along at the end, but um, one thing that I, I think we look at here is that Jesus wanted the Jews that he was talking to to see themselves in this story. This is a journey that probably many of them had taken. It was also a journey that was known to be dangerous and solitary if you went by yourself. It would not have been uncommon for you to have been waylaid by robbers um, and things taken from you and they didn't really care. Uh, things are not that different, you know, they didn't really care if they beat you and left you for dead. They didn't care if you died. Um, but it, it's kind of interesting here, what we see here it says, it says, as a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw me pass by the other side, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, most of the things that I've seen on this have said that it was because the Pharisee and the scribe were busy, or the Levite, the Pharisee, I'm going to write, the priest and the Levite were busy. Uh, for those of us who are VeggieTale fans, it's where you get that little song in your, your mind going, busy, busy, terribly busy. Um, I don't sound anything like the, the cucumbers, but anyway, um, but they were busy. But, but sometimes, I, you know, if we look at this time frame, did the um, Levite and the priest uh, have something else in their mind? Um, is something that we're not um, necessarily familiar with or uh, that, is, uh, that, that is good for us to, or it's good for us to remember, is that... Um, the Levite and the priest were dealing with things such as, uh, I think they called it 
ritual uncleanness or ceremonial uncleanness um, that if they came into contact um, with a dead body, they would be considered uh, ceremonially uh, unclean and that would mean that they could not participate um, and they could not participate in certain um, jobs within the temple until a certain time period had passed. Um, so that they may indeed have been very busy, uh, but they, um, some may think would have maybe had a better um, idea of thinking like, well, maybe the guy's dead already. Uh, what's, you know, why should I make myself uh, ceremonially unclean uh, when there's really nothing I can do anyway? And we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, hopefully if we have time at the end, a little more, a little more detail. Um, but it, it shouldn't be lost on us. These are two people who should know the law. They should know the right answer to the, the, the question that was asked about loving God with, with everything and then loving their neighbor themselves. And yet they saw their jobs or what they were doing far more important than checking on a person to see if they were indeed um, alive or dead or, or some of that nature. But in verse 33, it says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, I read that as meaning that the, that the um, Levite and the priest did not have compassion. They did not, for what I think, they didn't care. But this Samaritan had compassion on, for whatever reason, I'm thinking he knew he was Jewish. Now, I will confess, um, Having looked at it, I don't know that I um, can completely grasp how much hatred there was between the Samaritans and the Jews. And, and this had been going on for a very long time. This was not a, a recent thing. This was from way back. And, and it wasn't just a dislike. Um, it was them seeing it as an anathema, uh, them seeing uh, the Samaritan, the Samaritan and the Jews as, as horrible people. Um, that probably a lot of them, if the, the priest and the Levite had seen a Samaritan way late, would have thought, oh, he got what he deserved um, because they're such horrible people. Um, but this Samaritan um, had compassion and he went over and he took care of him. Um, now, I don't know if the Samaritans still adhered to the uh, ceremonial clean, cleanness um, teachings of the traditions of, of the, the teachers of the law, um, but it's possible that they did. But he was more concerned about this person than he was wherever he's going. And you think about this, he was going on a trip somewhere. He had some purpose, uh, could be a business trip or something of that nature. And he was not concerned about whether or not he was going to be late. Uh, he wasn't concerned about how long this was going to take. He just knew that somebody was in need and that he was going to take care of them. So he said, took him, he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. He continued to take care of him. And then uh, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now this is maybe reading a little bit into this and I apologize if it's going beyond what is written. Um, but I get the feeling the innkeeper had seen this Samaritan before, uh, that this was a journey that this Samaritan took on a regular basis and that he was going to be coming back by. Um, and just and so we're just aware that the denarii is basically a day's wage. So he gave him two days wages in order to take care of him. Um, and then we come down here and he says, took care of him. Whatever you spend more, I will pay you when I come back. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Now, I love the lawyer's response here. He doesn't say the Samaritan. He says, the one who showed him mercy. It's really quite fascinating that the, the lawyer wouldn't even say the nationality or the ethnicity of the person. He would just be the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You know, reminding the, um, this teacher of the law, the lawyer, 
that knowing what the law says and saying that you can rightly apply the law doesn't mean you're doing it right. It's that idea that we're not saved by works, but by our works, we show that we are saved. So the lawyer knew the letter of the law. He may have even perceived the spirit of the law. However, he did not um, partake um, in the spirit of the law and helping out somebody else who was in need. Now, I'm going to allow you um, to uh, unmute yourselves if you, if you have something that you want to say. Um, so um, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, hopefully you guys will respond. Uh, otherwise, I'll be uh, perhaps calling you out. Um, just kidding. I won't. Yes, I will call you out. Never mind. Um, so, so this good Samaritan, this person that Jews hated, that uh, he probably did not care for Jews a whole lot, or at least, you know, we don't know that for a fact, but it says, so how do we make that application to today? And so let's, let's, let's think of three questions, um, and maybe that um, has a little more, uh, maybe, I don't, maybe I don't know now on the, the day of COVID-19, this might have worked better before that. But um, so what happens if you come across a, a person who is obviously hurt, but is obviously also drunk? What what would you do? What do you do? So you, you can't just raise your hand. You have to actually unmute yourself and um, say something. I'm going to raise my, put my mask on, put on my gloves, and then go check them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Is Is that the right thing to do? Well, I think... So, and then, you know, get your phone out, 911, uh, to get medical help for the guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's what we should do. If I'm honest, would I maybe look the other way, pretend I didn't see it? I don't know. That's what, <laughs> I might end up being somewhat like that lawyer, if I'm honest. Yeah. I would hope not, but it's hard to say. Yeah. And, you know, and there's, there's so, um, I think sometimes we can want to be very quick to say that we wouldn't do that, but, you know, when you're in a hurry or you're not sure you saw something or, you know, you, you, we do kind of just put it out of our mind and move on to the next thing. And, or we do the thing of like, well, Hey, there's a, there's somebody behind me. They'll they're gonna they'll take care of it. I, I don't I don't need to take care of it. Now well, it might be because I'm a nurse that, that I would tend to want to do more. Sadly, it'd be because of that, not necessarily because obviously the Lord would want it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in this day and age, we definitely could go and and try to ascertain how badly hurt they are. And, and call 911 or call emergency services. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've had situations in the past, and it's kind of interesting. I was, I was going to buy a pair of shoes. This does not please, I am not, this is one time out of a billion I did the right thing. Um, so there's still 999 million other times I didn't do it right, but Sitting a light, and uh, somebody ran a red light and T-boned a car and just threw this lady over into the grass. And uh, I stopped uh, to see if she was okay and to call 911. And what was really um, fascinating in the sense of how small a world it is, she turned out to be somebody I worked with at the health department. And um, later she said how wonderful it was to see a familiar face, someone that she knew. Uh, the health department has 700 people, so she may not have known me, but it was somebody I had met before. We knew each other. Um, and then she just thought I was able to just wait with her until the ambulance people came. Um, and, you know, I, I never did get my shoes, um, but that's, that's not, uh, shoes aren't really that important. So, all right, now how about this next thing? And, I, and I'm going to uh, start this with a scripture reading from Deuteronomy 22. Maybe not the exact same parallel, um, it, it says uh, in Deuteronomy 22, 4, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them, 
you shall help him to lift them up again. So you come upon a person trying to push start his car. What do you do? Or what I see, push their car through an intersection or try to push it into a parking lot um, to get gas because they've somehow just driven past the gas station and didn't get gas. I can tell you what not to do because I got in trouble for it. Okay. You, you, you take your car, slowly go up and use your bumper to push their car across the massive intersection until you get halfway through and the cop stops you. Because you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Only do it if you have like a bar or a thing of that nature, yeah. Um, now, honestly, people like me have to be, think rightly yep. as with my back, it probably would not be a great thing for me to uh, push the car, um, but I could always block traffic behind them so that they don't have to worry about getting hit. Uh, it's, right. you know, a lot of people get hit, you know, just because um, just people are not paying attention. But if we have the ability, should we help them push their car out of the street? Yep. My, <laughs> my boys can tell you when we would run across, I would say, all right, guys, out. <laughs> I would stay in the car and make them go help push. <laughs> One of the things that I've done is I've actually been out there and done, and I've done it quite a few times. One of the things that happens too is if you go out and you try to help somebody, seems like a few other people will come up and join you. Yeah. Right. See, I mean, you know, it's just like, and, and as to the previous situation, I had a situation one time where I had a man on a motorcycle had had an accident and I saw the headlight going up in the sky. And this was right at the beginning of all the AIDS virus. And he was bleeding all over the place and people wouldn't go anywhere near him. Okay. And I just, you know, I, it was the Lord. I mean, I just went over there and I grabbed his hand and I told him, I said, everything will be all right. Yeah. When I had the fire engines, you know, the 911 people, they were there. So, yeah. I mean, right. But that's, you've got to let the Lord lead you. The Holy Spirit has to be involved in that. There are times when you should walk away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it, sometimes you're more of a hindrance than you are a help. Yeah. So, so yeah, you've you got to let like the Holy me, Spirit lead you. You could be like me. I'll walk up and pass out and won't be able to figure out who's the person who was hurt. You know, when I see the blood. All right, next, next question. Now, this one I think is a little more difficult because in my heart, this is one that I would love to say that I would definitely do something, but um, it just, I, I, I think my, my heart is, uh, is a lot stronger than my uh, head, but then my head takes over. What about if you come across two people who are fighting in the street? Do you try to intervene? I would say you need to call 911 and stay. Uh, of course, I'm female. I do not know Taekwondo. Um, so I don't know what else I could do. I guess I could stomp on a foot. <laughs> well, I. <laughs> Again, this is just an example of me. I, I was I was out, um, a guy and I were sitting at a park taking our, our lunch and for whatever reason, I don't know if you've ever been around people and you just kind of get the sense while you watch them that something's not quite right. And uh, I told my friend, I said like, I think those two people are gonna get in a fight. Of course he does what, you know, probably a lot of us would do, it's no aspersion on him. He's like, well, good, we should leave. Um, I'm like, well, no, should we try to, <laughs> should we try to stop them? And both of them were like way bigger than me. And, um, and he's like, no. Um, and, and so I was like, well, should we at least call the police? And, uh, and he's like, well, we can call 911. Of course they want to know like, well, are they actually fighting? I was like, well, no, they're not actually fighting, but I just, I got this feeling by, watching them. I mean, they were obviously arguing. Um, and, uh, and they're like, well, you know, call us back if they actually start to fight. And of course, as we hang up, one just wallops living daylights out of the over. It was out of the other. It was like, you know, 
world's shortest fight or second shortest fight. Um, but I, I just felt like maybe if I had gone over there and just interceded that not, I wouldn't hope that they would beat me up instead, but maybe just by interjecting myself, maybe they would have calmed down a little bit. Um, you know, but I, I think it's, it can be challenging um, yeah. because it's, you know, I, this is not talking about two people, but like I've, I've been told, hey, if there's two big dogs in a fight, just let them fight. Don't try to stop them because um, it's probably going to end worse for you. Um, but I think what Romeo said is very helpful is that we need to, um, we need to really uh, be praying, uh, let the Holy Spirit lead us. And perhaps maybe we can slightly interject. I mean, it's so heartbreaking when you you hear about a person who is mugged or a lady that is raped or these things, and people take out their cell phones and video it, but don't say a word and don't call 911. They don't do anything yeah. except capture it for a video. I mean, hopefully as believers, we have just way more compassion than that on, on others. Um, a couple, uh, just one more than something that has been kind of tugging at my brain for a while. Um, so thinking about the priest and the Levite, you know, um, these were, I don't know, we don't know a lot about them. Um, obviously just what's told in the story. And, um, but, you know, they probably had um, something to do uh, with regard to worship. If they were... Um, ceremonially unclean or spiritually unclean, they would not be able to participate. So it's possible that not were they just busy, but I was thinking perhaps they had too high a view of the importance of their job inside um, the religious practice. They're like, oh, you know, if I go over there and help them and they are dead, I'm going to be ceremonially unclean and that I can't fulfill my job. And my job is so important that I don't want to take a chance on doing that. And um, I, I just wonder if, uh, in, in a way, um, these people were not just looking at the other Jew going, like, maybe they're dead, but they're always, maybe they were thinking too highly of themselves. But, but I love this idea, you know, it's like, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And here's it, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if your neighbor saw you laying in the road hurt, would you want them to go like, well, he wouldn't help me, so I'm not going to help him. You know, um, you know, it's just it's just important for us to realize that, you know, whatever it is we're doing, um, you know, like even for me, uh, say it's a Sunday morning and I'm on my way to to um, to teach. Um, not now, obviously, I'm on my way. I don't often go by too many actions on the way from the uh, kitchen to the, the dining room table, um, except maybe by the puppy. But that's a different kind of accent. Um, but, you know, what would I say? What I say, like, oh, man, I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday school this morning. I don't have time to stop. Well, you know, is that having too high an opinion of myself? Would I, should I rather say, well, you know what? Let me call Dan or, or Jeremy um, or somebody else and let them go ahead and take care of it. And uh, if I'm late, I'm late. Uh, we'll survive. So... But here's the thing I want us to think about. Um, this is the thing that's just been um, niggling at my, my brain. Is, um, and we probably won't have time to, to plumb the depth of it tonight, but in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, uh, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And we think about this passages of, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. These were the two things that summed up all the law and the prophets. These are the things that were more important than all the burnt sacrifices. So if we, we think about these passages, in what ways did Jesus demonstrate his fulfillment of loving the Father with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength and all of his mind? Well, one way is that he submitted, he became obedient to the point of death, even death 
on a cross, which is what is said in Philippians. Mm -hmm. That was a huge deal. Yeah. That's complete obedience. Okay. Does does it even start before the obedience on the cross? Oh, sure. But in Philippians, it talks about, you know, do not think more highly about yourself. Um, and consider the needs of others as more important than yourself in that whole section there. But it ends up with became obedient uh, to the point of death, even death on the cross. So that's, that is the culmination possibly, but that is important. Yeah. I was thinking uh, in ages past as he, as the triune God had, uh, I don't know how, the, how you say this, uh, agreed to the plan. Um, showing that he did and um, you know being the love he had for his father allowing him to be submissive to his earthly parents um, how many of us earthly children think we know more than our parents I mean Jesus rightly could have said I know it all <laughs> and and yet he he didn't do that um, and that, that's showing it it, I guess it was for me that thinking about how we demonstrate our love for God by how we submit to his word, how we submit to him, how we submit to the people around us um, that we're supposed to, how I love my wife. All of these things are demonstrations of um, my love for God and, and how the things. Now, now what about um, thinking about how he demonstrated his fulfillment of loving his neighbor as himself? All right, it can't just be Jeanette and Dan answering. I'm going to unmute one of yeah. you. <laughs> I don't really see that many people on, but one thing I was thinking of is that, you know, he said, great. If they're not in video, they're. No. Greater love has no one that he laid down his life for his friend, but the Lord laid his life down for enemies. Um, yes, the disciples were there, but. He died for me uh, while I was yet unborn, and before I became saved, I was his enemy. Yeah, it's um. So I guess one of the reasons I've been thinking about this is is the. It is very clear in my mind that this the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan is about who's your neighbor. Jesus trying to push the the. Jews beyond their small little world that other Jews were their neighbors and other people weren't. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to um, go, but I, but I was thinking, you know, I don't know if the right word is corollary or, you know, Jesus, um, while not a Samaritan, um, took compassion on, on us who were dead in our trespass who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, um, right. but rather became obedient to God. And, and, I, and I'm not trying to say that this parable, you can make a direct line to that, but I, I can kind of see, I don't know if the word is corollary or parallel, that, um, like what you said, Jeanette, we hate, hated God. We hated Jesus. We would have gladly nailed him to the cross without his imposition into our lives. And yet, he did not look at that and go like, well, you know, Father, give them what they deserve. Instead, you know, he paid the whole thing. Now, the reality is, you know, he was without sin. So his care for us was, was salvation. Um, but, you know, sometimes I, I lose sight or lose track of the reality that Jesus fulfilled all the law, which included, includes loving his neighbor as himself. And, and I don't think that we see every um, moment of Jesus' lives, of life uh, here while he was in, in the flesh, but I, I think if he saw someone who's ox had fallen in a ditch he would have gone and helped 
he would not have thought, well, I'm Jesus, the Messiah of the world. You guys go and help them. I um, I do think it's kind of funny, not funny, but I forget what show I was watching, but it's a, like a murder mystery show. And as one detective, he always sends the other people first into every dangerous situation. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's a little danger, a lot of danger. He always points to the younger guy and goes like, oh, you, you lead the way. And uh, yeah, before long, the other guy's looking back and going like, really? Uh, you know, so it's like a British show. So neither one has a gun. Um, you know, I'm always amazed. You're know, like, let's go confront this guy with a gun without a gun. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, Jesus, I don't believe did that. Jesus, if he saw one in, someone in need, he would help them. We saw that he wasn't concerned about being unclean or spiritually unclean or ceremonially unclean by lepers. Uh, supposedly, it's something I read that that leprosy, touching or coming in contact with somebody who was leprous, was seen far more egregious as coming with than in contact with someone who was dead, um, which is kind of weird, but I guess because of the skin disease. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus didn't care. You know, he 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 didn't. Um, he still fulfilled that and because he could help them. And, and I, I just am, am so amazed by that. Um, right. Anybody else have something to share? Oh, I'm not somebody else, but one thing that just speaks volumes <laughs> is that the Lord in his parable used a Samaritan to do what was right and the Jews, the leaders, uh, the, the Pharisees, the, the Levites, saw them as a pariah. Yeah. And yet he specifically said that. And um, we need to be careful as we interact with our neighbors and stuff, regardless of whatever, fill in the blank, that we need to live Jesus before them. Yep. Um, we have a neighbor who uh, moved in as a male and now as a female. And when uh, Rachel is in need, we go and we help. Yeah. Because that's what God would have us do. And that's not putting a stamp of approval on the choices that were made. Yeah. But I do think it's filling what God has called us to do. Yeah, very true. That's in a, in a very good example. Well, that's, that's interesting that she said that because I was thinking, what would the hero be of, of a, if we were to contemporize it? And I was thinking maybe it would be a gay atheist who would help the person. Right. You know, if we were to contemporize that, someone that we would least expect, mm -hmm. and that would shock us. Mm -hmm. That would be, you know, similar perhaps to the way that the Samaritan being the hero of the story would have shocked his Jewish audience. Right. Because that was a rebuke. The parable was a rebuke to uh, the lawyer who was trying to justify himself. Yeah. Did you want to say something, James? I saw your forehead sneak in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was there was two thoughts that when you were talking, and I never really thought about it. You know, they say, uh, "Do unto others as you have them do unto you." Mm -hmm. The intriguing thing is, it isn't us to say we should respond how others have done to us. Right. It's, it's the other way around. And that is intriguing because that means immediately it, you give up what's already happened. It doesn't matter what the history has been, you've got to do the right thing. And then right. the other was the aspect of, it's one thing if you're hurt in an accident and somebody runs up, you want to help. What the Lord did is we didn't even know we needed help. And if you ever interfered with somebody, you see them, something's about to go wrong and you run up, what are you doing? What are you messing with me? I don't need your help, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the things that's interesting is we don't think we needed his help. A lot of people don't think they need his help. Yeah. Right. Very true. So. Well, one of the things that uh, I've been looking at is basically to love at, as you would to love as you would love yourself, okay? Because we have a problem in our society nowadays where a lot of people don't love themselves. 
Mm. Especially some of these teenagers that are committing suicide and things like that. They don't. They, they think their life is not worth anything. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we've got to realize that th there are those people, and you can't say that to them. You know, well, what about you know, love yourself? Okay, they don't really right. love themselves. Yeah. So we have to be careful sometimes when we're ministering to somebody to say that you know, to. Uh, say as you should love yourself <laughs> yeah as god loves you would be the better way mm -hmm. mm. well and, and that's why we we should be active demonstration of of love to others even you know and it is kind of sad because i, I think so many christians have um damaged the cause of christ because i i can disagree as janessa with someone's life choices it doesn't mean that I, I don't love them and, and I don't help them. Now, honestly, sometimes it's nearly impossible to help them because they don't want to be helped. And I, I don't think, um, I don't think we can, I don't, I don't think we can force them to take our help. Um, but we definitely can be praying. I mean, you know, I, I think of stories I've heard where people have prayed for almost a lifetime for someone to come to the Lord. And it's not until the end that they do. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's just something that we do, we do what we can, uh, even if we don't necessarily think it's um, what we'd like to do, if that makes sense. So. Yeah. I was just thinking of Franklin Graham in the hospital that his organization put up at Central Park and the vitriol that his organization has faced uh from some maybe even very few citizens of new york city um and um it just hurt my heart because they meet the needs of anybody who comes yeah. they do have standards you can't work with their ministry unless you sign the statement of faith and that's appropriate yeah. but they don't forbid anybody from coming and though whoever comes whomever will be treated with love and kindness and their needs will be met yep. and so um i was just listening to him i think it was last night or the night before and it was kind of sad you know he said we're, we're not trying to get into a, a debate with anybody we were asked to go and we said yes yeah i mean this is what they do around the world you know <laughs> so yeah. So, all right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close this with a word of prayer and, uh, and then I'll stop the recording. And then um, anybody who uh, wants to stick, stick around and get on the uh, video feed and, and say hi, I'll do that. And um, I'll stop the, uh, before we get into that part, we'll stop the YouTube recording. And if anybody from uh, Facebook wants to hop over onto the Zoom, they can do that. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this night. Lord, thank you, Lord, for application. Um, Lord, that uh, we would find ways to reach out to our neighbors, whether it's just uh, seeing them out beside their house today or tomorrow and just seeing if they're all okay, uh, maybe having a couple of extra provisions to help uh, if they need something. Um, but Lord, we just ask that um, that even in this time that uh, things are not normal, that we would still find ways to to love our neighbors. And Lord, that I think in my heart is number one is to pray for them, Lord, and um, to if I see them to let them know that I'm praying for them. Lord, I just there's a lot of hurting people around us, uh, people who need uh, your intervention. Lord, I just uh, ask that as the night goes on, that we would um, honor you, Lord, that we would use our time wisely, and we thank you for mm. your grace in our lives. It's in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.